What's up guys, so me and my brother are here, now we're going to be watching Japanese Urban Legends. We already just did a Try Not to Laugh challenge, we're just waiting for it to upload right now, so. Just, uh, stay tuned here, we're getting ready to watch it here now. This one's for Sukisawa Village. And Today it's one of my most favorite Japanese Urban Legends. Camp. First, you grab one of these, then... Hidden and it's all tied in with the Tsuyama Master, with the guy with the flashlights on, on his head. That masquer like 33 Tsubisawa. villagers one night with a shotgun day, and a, a man from the sword. village went crazy. Right now, this is Terry Devlin talking, day, one of my favorite, you know, YouTubers. Living in the village. And then, so it is here the story, life. then. Nobody knows why he went crazy. Nor why he went on such a violent crime spree. But the end result of this horrific crime remained the same. Sugisawa village became empty. The events of that day were so cruel that the local government decided to leave the village abandoned and at the same time deny anything ever took place. They then erased all trace of the village from the local maps. Luckily, the village was deep in the mountains, so it was easy to cover the events up. But, of course, they couldn't erase the fact that the horrific crime did take place in the first place. There were rumours of thick bloodstains all over the village, and those who approached the village would undoubtedly be cursed by the evil spirits that lived there. Furthermore, according to the legend, it's impossible to reach Sugisawa unless you leave the straight path that leads further into the mountains. Then, you will find a sign with a warning standing at the entrance. That sign states, You may enter, but do so at your own risk. You can also find an old red shrine gate at the entrance and a stone shaped like a skull sitting at its feet. So if anybody's ever played Fatal Frame 2, Crimson Butterfly, Tsukisawa Village is actually inspired by it. Welcome to Toshiden, exploring Japanese urban legends. I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and on this show we'll be looking at different urban legends from Japan, how they came about, and, when possible, the truth behind them. Before we get started this week, I have a quick announcement to make. Starting from Friday, the 24th of August, you can grab Toshiden, Exploring Japanese Urban Legends Volume 1 from Amazon for just 99 cents. Harry Devlin is also a the book, book writer. Yet, there's no better time. The book has been getting some really great reviews. I believe she's like from Australia which or makes something me really happy. because she has like so some accent but she's all been holding out on getting it. Japanese Urban Legends. Grab it now while you can. Like you. Yeah, it like returns me. to full price next week. So don't miss out. Now, this week's episode is about one of my favorite cursed villages. Mine too. The village of Sugisawa. She's also made another video for Sugisawa Village as well. We'll watch that one then after this one. The legend of Sugisawa Village first appeared in the 1990s, although the events mentioned in the legend itself are purported to take place early in the Showa era, the late 1920s and early 30s. The story was one of the first and biggest to be spread when the internet started to become more common in Japanese households in the 90s. It became so popular that several media outlets picked up on it, and it was through the TV show Kiseki Taiken Unbelievable in 2000 that it really reached the masses. 
the episode set out to find this fabled village and determine whether it actually existed or not. They searched throughout not just Aomori Prefecture, but similar stories all over Japan. But in the end, they never found it. The program then claimed that Sukisawa Village must exist in a space time warp, able to appear and disappear at will. After the program aired, many people set out to find the village themselves, uploading blog entries and later YouTube videos on their findings, many of which you can still watch on the internet today. Yeah, if I've seen some of them YouTube、Despite、videos where it's Sukisawa the contrary, Village, I've even made an album on my Facebook for it. Nobody has ever found the real Sukisawa Village of legend. And、there's like these a、uh, couple of soda cans and stuff like on this rock and stuff, couple rocks. The legend like of Sugisawa、uh, Village began in Aomori, the place the, the village is supposed to be located. There's a Tori Gate. There was a real village called Kosugi. It was a small village in the Obatakezawa district of Aomori City. This area received、saying. its name because of a mountain stream. That flows through the cedar forest. Sugi means cedar, and Sawa means marsh or mountain stream. People would say they were going to the cedar, which sounded a lot like the word Sugi Sawa in Japanese, and thus it came to be affectionately called that. However, the village was only accessible by foot. And as the years passed, it became abandoned because of depopulation, not a murderous crime spree. So, how did the benign village of Sugisawa become the fabled site of such a horrific crime? There was an actual crime in 1938, the same time the Sugisawa legend is supposed to have happened. That took place in the small village of Kamo, close to Tsuyama in Okayama Prefecture. A man, Mutsuo Toi, 21 at the time, killed 30 people and injured three others before killing himself. If anybody's ever seen the movie Village of Doom, it came out like in the 70s or 80s. It talks about all about that, about the Tsuyama massacre, and about what he did. You can find those on YouTube. There's like a part one and a part two, but it's in Japanese language, but it's English subtitles. So it's one of my favorite movies as well. Toi had tuberculosis, and in his suicide note, claimed that the villagers treated him cruelly, so he wished to extract revenge. He snuck into people's homes over the course of a single night. And using a shotgun, katana, and axe, killed over half the village's occupants、Dang. before killing himself at dawn. Although Okayama and Aomori are separated by quite a distance, somehow the story of this crime in Okayama was adapted to the abandoned village in Aomori, and became the modern-day legend of Sugisawa Village. But how do you know that you've found Sugisawa Village? There are several key signs that you have stumbled upon it. Number one, there is a sign at the entrance that states, "You must not proceed past this point. There can be no guarantee for your life if you do." There are variations on the exact wording, but. In every version, the sign states that if you go past it, you will be in big trouble. Number two, there is an old red shrine gate at the entrance to the village, beneath which you'll find a stone that's shaped like a skull. Number three, upon entering the village, you'll find several abandoned buildings with blood stains on the walls. Now, several people claim to have visited Sugisawa over the years. The following 
is a tale from someone calling themselves Matsu-san. There's other pictures on Google. So let's say you have to read an incredibly long email from your boss that you have to finish well before the big meeting brain. starts in 10 minutes. This is one of them. This is a story someone who went to Sugisawa village told me. They were driving up the mountain when they finally found a gravel road they could pass through. When they saw a sign, they ignored it and kept going before they realized they'd arrived at Sugisawa village. The place apparently stank of garbage. There were a few wooden buildings and a lot of rubbish lying around. This person felt someone watching them though, and feeling creeped out, they left. A few days later... Wait, so like, is this part like before uh, people got killed or after? It was after. There's been people and stuff um, saying they'd been there and they gave their, you know, incidents and stuff about what happened. And let's just say a couple of them they haven't been seen ever again in some girl that was there. Well, I'm sure they'll tell about in the story. Did they die? I think. But the place, they but they, the, the place, the whole village is haunted there by the villagers that were massacred and stuff from the Suyama massacre. But they all came back as demons to haunt. Dang. So that's what they meant by being watched. And the, gov the Japanese government tried to cover the Tsuyama massacre up because they say it's one of the most bloodiest massacres in Japan and no one would ever forget it. But they can't cover up something that happened because it's going to be found sooner or later because it was a very small village and it was up in the mountains of Amori, which uh, um, they say it's near Amori Airport. Because they mentioned about a cop and stuff on here that says about it. And he tries to, you know, warn people saying, oh, don't go. So, keep on going with the thing. A friend who was with the person at the time died. Dang. And the following is from Keiko-san in Saitama. I went to Aomori Prefecture to go mountain climbing. About two hours into climbing, the area was wrapped in fog and I couldn't see well. I made my way slowly up the mountain so I didn't fall and there were several villages along the way. Then it was like there was this village smack bang in the middle of the jungle. It was dark so I pulled out my torch and approached it. There were six buildings in total, and I went from house to house, checking each one. There was no sign that anybody lived there. All I saw were two cats. While I was walking around, I sensed somebody approaching me. Yet, when I looked around, nobody was there. It was incredibly strange. There were houses further back in the village as well, but I was too scared to go and look at them. About 20 minutes later, I noticed a man standing behind me. He was wearing a straw hat and had pale skin and blue eyes. I said hello, but he said nothing in reply. I paid him no attention and kept walking. So could that have been like a ghost? That was one of the villagers. They wore straw hats kind of back then, but get you're going to get ready to hear what happens. Oh god, does the person die? The person walks away, starts wait, walking don't away. Spoil, don't spoil yeah, it, yeah, person. just keep going. I'm going to spoil it. But then it. he suddenly screamed and ran at me. I ran and finally reached the sign that stated I was back on the mountain climbing track. That was the first time I'd ever been so scared. I still don't know what that guy was doing there now. I told people about what happened there, but nobody believes me. And the following message was posted by somebody claiming to be a police officer 
in Aomori. Sugisawa village exists. It's close to Aomori airport. But you must never go looking for it. And please, don't enter it half-cocked. Because if you do, you'll never come back. Reading the Book of Mormon, it gave me the same feeling that the There's Bible more gives me. And stuff. Sukisawa Village is a perfect example of an urban legend being in the right place at the right time. While it was already popular beforehand, it wasn't until a TV show aired a special episode searching for the mythical village that it really took off. And it remains the most well-known missing village tale to date. You can still find people posting evidence of their adventures searching for it on the internet. And there have been various movies and even games made about it as well. Which would have been fatal for I even too. played one of them on my YouTube channel. And While there's Sugisawa also one may never have existed. There's also one called Escape from Sukisawa Village. It's actually on an Android, but right now you kind of can't find it because they kind of took it off for some reason. But I have it on my old iPad, but I barely use it. Is it in reality? Its legend will continue to live on for quite some time. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Now we're getting ready to Don't watch this other one for Sukisawa Village. It tells us about a different story about some other couple people who had said they they seen it. Just uh, go in there, type in Terry Devlin, Sukisawa Village, and I'll show you. We already watched that one, but there's a different one. It tells us about Cursed Villages. Now and, and that would be the first one. That would have been Escape from Sukisawa Village. Wait, go over a little bit more. It would have been that one, yeah. This? Yeah. It tells a different story, but it tells some other witnesses and stuff that claim the Damn, I don't have that much noise. A young man visits his grandparents in the countryside. While relaxing in the front yard, he sees a wide-brimmed hat moving behind the hedge. A woman appears, but as she walks away, he realizes the hedge is over two meters tall. If he could see her over that, then... When he mentions this strange woman to his grandfather, he finds out that her name is Hashakusama, the eight-foot tall woman, and she only appears before those she intends to snatch away. And she's supposed to be on one of the, the Fatal Frame games too, like the newer ones, but I can't play that one because it didn't board it. In her eight foot shed. tall woman. When her friend, she's a Shinto also priest, an as well. sees it, he becomes violently ill and warns everyone not to touch it. It's a kotolibako, a box filled with an incredible curse from which none who touch it can escape. In Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Volume 2, you'll find over 90 scary stories and urban legends, many of which have been translated exclusively for this book. These are tales of Japanese ghosts, murder, suicide, revenge, cursed objects, and more. Find hey, out what lurks deep revenge. in the Japanese countryside, <laughs> fun. how technology is out to get ain't you. To you, the secrets <laughs> behind those who fight the supernatural, and much more. There's no masked killer hiding behind the bushes with a machete inside these pages. Find out what horrors are truly terrifying a nation right here. Available in ebook and paperback, February 3rd. That's what her books look like. She has a bunch of them. And she's like very famous and well known. She's like a bestseller too. Hey guys. This is your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to another episode of Kobana, True Japanese Scary Stories from Around the Internet. As you just heard, Kobana Volume 2 goes on sale this week. As much as I enjoyed making the first book, I think this one is a big improvement in all areas. It comes in at the same length as the first book, and along with the usual smaller tales, there are a few more well-known legends in this one as well, such as Hashakusama, Tsukima Onna, 
and my personal favorite, the Kotolibako. I'll be featuring the Kotolibako in a future podcast, but if you don't want to wait, go check out the book now. Now, this week's episode is one of my all-time favorite themes. There's a lot of things I like about Japanese horror, but one of the biggest has to be the cursed villages. Yeah, These one of my tiny places hidden way out in the middle of nowhere Japanese urban that legend. suddenly disappear overnight. Or the curse that carries on throughout the generations. Japan has this beautiful contrast of huge, bustling cities and tiny, out-of-the-way villages that look like something you might have seen a century or two ago. Our first story this week is perhaps the most famous one of all. This one's called Sugisawa, the Cursed Village. In Aomori Prefecture, at the foot that would of be a the certain mountain, sign. there was once a small village called Sugisawa. One day, a man who lived there suddenly went crazy and killed everyone with a hatchet before killing Damn. himself. In the course of a single that day, would have been the, guy from the entire the population Master. of the village There's different was wiped stories out. and stuff about what he used to kill What him. happened was so horrifying, the local government then tried to hide what happened and erased all evidence that the village had ever existed. The village name was erased from maps and all official record of it deleted. For over 50 years, the village remained silent no one daring to go near it. However, no matter how much the government tries to conceal the truth, they cannot erase it from the memories of the people. The old folk in the area continue to tell the story of Sugisawa to this day. You could say it's an open secret amongst them. According to legend, there are three signs that reveal the path to Sugisawa. Number one, there, there it is. is a sign that on the would road be like the entrance the or something like that, that with the rocks there. To those who enter, and there would have been like some soda cans on there. There are in YouTube videos and stuff as well. Number two, there is an old rotting shrine gate at the entrance of the village, beneath which lies a stone shaped like a human skull. Number three, as you head into the village, there is an old abandoned building, a former house where, if you enter, you will find the bloodstains telling of the tragic event that once happened there. One particular story yeah, like about the village stains. goes as They're follows. Still there to even tell this day. One day, two young men and a woman you went know, for a drive deep ever in, in Japan, the mountains. Which I would like to go and live there one day. As I said in other videos, I would love to go and explore there and find it. And I think I know exactly where it is. Stumbled upon an old, beat-up shrine gate. Beneath the gate, there I were two no large ghosts. stones. Ghost One of them, me. shaped like a skull. The young driver saw it, and remembered a rumor he'd heard long ago. The rumor was that a skull found at the bottom of a shrine gate was a sign of the entrance to Sugisawa. The two men got out of the car. However, the young woman said to them, oh, I'm scared. Let's get out of here. They decided to search the village, however, and all went in together. About 100 meters after passing under the shrine gate, they suddenly found a large open area before them with four old abandoned buildings. The three of them the stepped houses. inside one of the buildings Something like that. and inside they found a large amount of dried blood on the walls. Like I said, dry blood. The two men felt a shiver run up their I spines. I know mostly everything about Suki Solid and Village the... because it's one of my favorites. I know a lot. The woman suddenly cried out. Hey, there's something strange about this place. Uh, I can feel a presence. The three of them fled the building in surprise, and as they did, they felt like they were being surrounded 
by a large number of people. The three of them ran for the car. However, something was wrong. The car probably didn't work. No matter how much they ran, they couldn't seem to reach the car. From the open space to the car should have only been 100 meters, and it was a straight path. Like so the there's no stop. way they could have when gotten they lost. They find the car. Even so, the girl as ran. the three of them kept running and running, they couldn't escape from Sugisawa. Unawares, the woman suddenly found herself separated from the two men, and as she kept running for what felt like forever, she somehow finally found herself back at the car. Thankfully, the keys were still in the ignition. She climbed into the driver's seat to go and get help, and turned the key to start the car. However, no matter how much she turned the key, the car refused to start. Oh. On the verge of tears, she kept turning the key over and over, Watch her trying to get the car to go. Then, a large sound suddenly reverberated from the windscreen. She looked and noticed the windscreen was covered in bloody red handprints. Ugh. No. Not just the windscreen. Countless bloody red handprints appeared on all the windows, as though they were all being beat upon at the same time. The woman crouched down in fear, and before long, she fainted. Ghost man, no respect. The next morning, one of the locals, out for a morning walk, stumbled upon the bloody car and the dumbfounded young woman inside. Her hair had turned white from fear overnight. She was taken to the hospital, where she explained her terrifying experience. Afterwards, she disappeared and was never seen again. Her two male friends were also never found. So, what do you think happened? I think the Tsukisawa villagers got a hold of them, and well, they couldn't leave. They, I think they were still trapped in the village, they couldn't leave. But the Wait, girl so did. after the girl left the hospital, do you think she might have died? She could have, I believe, escaped from the hospital and tried to go in hiding in case if, you know, they would try to, to look for her. Or she probably got lured back into, they were probably luring her back to the village and then they, you know, got rid of her. And then the two guys, they, yeah, they probably died. Probably. Yeah. All right, now we're going to get ready to watch... A different yeah. video. Since I saw the village is over. Yeah, yeah this end this one. And next we're gonna watch about in Uniki Village. There's the an Uniki Village real. I wanna say it's over. No, it's gonna talk about other villages. Oh, it's supposedly saw, been saw around for quite some time in Aomori Prefecture Wait. where the story takes place. But it became famous nationwide after appearing on a supernatural investigation TV show. No way, it's still going. It's wait. been the basis for many stories since then, including that of one of my all-time favorite video games, Fatal Frame 2. There you go, like to I said. To this day, people still try Fatal to Frame find 2. the village. All God's village. And if you go on YouTube, village. you can see various videos if that people have uploaded woods, of their exploits. And I'll leave a few links on village. koabana.net if well, you want to go and forever. check them out for yourself. Now, our next story well, is about a young dark. boy who moves and to a small, modern residential over over. town in Hiroshima Prefecture. He makes friends with another young girl, but as time goes on, he soon comes to realize not everything in the town is truly mm. as it seems. Now, it's talking about a different what dark urban history legend does it hide? Find out in Kotori Kozo. This one talks about a, a ritual of some girl. This is a strange a story that happened to me when I was a child. It's based on my memories as a kid, so it might be a little fuzzy in parts. 
but please bear with me. This takes place around the time I was starting elementary school. Elementary so school. I would have been around five years old. At the time, I lived in Hiroshima Prefecture. So, due to my father's job, we had to move. The place we were moving to was one of those so-called residential development towns. Those who are born and raised in the city probably won't understand, but basically they take a mountain and flatten it, creating a new residential town on top. There were a lot of these in Hiroshima at the time, but not just in Hiroshima, I think these were popping up all over the countryside. So when you drive up the mountain, you suddenly reach an area where everything spreads out and that's where the residential town was. It was surrounded by other mountains. We moved to this new house, but it was still the countryside, so the nights were dark. The town had only just barely opened, so there were few people. As such, my parents said to me, if you stay out after dark, you'll be snatched away and eaten by Kotori Kozo. Thinking back on it now, it was clearly just their way of saying, come back home early. Like they but say, every town to has a its child, secrets. Some I are just darker than others. With the head of a small bird, a kotori, and the body of a small elephant, kozo. I was so scared that such a creature might exist that no matter how much fun I was having, I always made sure to get back home on time. A few houses down from ours, there was a girl the same age as me, Emko, who had already been living there for quite some time. She was really cute. I'd even go so far as to say she was my first love. Anyway, we used to play together all the time. There were a lot of empty lots and houses under construction around. We'd sneak around and pretend they were our secret bases and pretend dolls were our children and play family. We'd also go back to Emko's room and read comics and play. At some point, I started going to elementary school. And of course, I made friends with the boys there. And we would rough house a lot. But I also continued to play with Emko. While all this was going on, one day I realized something. Hmm? Emko is the same age as me, so why isn't she at school? But I was still a child, so I soon forgot about it and didn't think too deeply on the subject. One day, we went to a mountain behind the school called Mount G for a school trip. It was big enough for us kids to reach the top in about an hour and a half on foot. There was a shrine at the peak, but there were so many trees that, despite the fact it was midday, it was kind of gloomy. It was a frightening place for a child. But we formed a line and as we started walking up, I noticed Emko was beside me. Ah, oh, it's you. So you really do go to the same school. I wonder what class you're in, I thought to myself. There were a few classes, so it's not like we knew everyone. I grabbed her hand and we walked up the mountain together. But Emko seemed different to usual, more sad. She said very little the entire time. We reached the top and it was time to sit down and have lunch. I wanted to eat with Emko, but when I went to find her, she was nowhere to be found. Plus, the more I thought about it, if I ate lunch with a girl, the boys would tease me. In the end, I didn't see Emko again that day. Then, after that trip, for some reason I saw Emko around less and less. I mean, I don't remember very clearly, but after that trip up Mount G, I feel like I played with Emko a few more times. But at the same time, I feel like I never saw her again. 
my memories aren't very clear. At the end of the second grade, we moved to Tokyo for my father's work once again. At the time, Emko was no longer on my mind so much. I even liked someone else. On the day we moved out, I wasn't really thinking about her either. Up until this point is the story of my childhood. Sorry it was so long. Let's get to the main part. After moving to Tokyo during the spring where I was about to begin the third grade, we never returned to Hiroshima again. A few years ago, I found this thread on Nichan, and when I started reading some blogs, I came across the story Kotolibako. I didn't think much of it at the time, but while I was smoking a cigarette a few days later, I thought, come to think of it, Kotolibako can be written like Kotori Bako, child stealing box. Shimane Prefecture is also close to Hiroshima. Then it hit me. Hang on. The Kotori Kozo my parents tried to scare me with. That wasn't it at all. They really meant the child stealing man. Kotori Kozo. The very next day, I called my parents to find out. When you said Kotori Kozo, did you mean the child stealing man? What's that about? Ah, yeah, that's right. You did well remembering that. It's apparently a story they tell in the A district, but I don't know much more about it myself. The A district was the place we lived in in Hiroshima. And so, just like that, I was unable to find out any more about the Kotori Kozo. A few months later, I went to Hiroshima for a few days for work. I took a rental car and went to visit the old residential town we used to live in. The old house was still there, but of course another family was living in it. It looked exactly the same as it did back then, and made me feel nostalgic. I stopped in front of the house and got out of the car, taking a quick look around. Up ahead I saw Emko's house. It also looked exactly the same as it did back then. By now, Emko must have gotten married and had a family of her own. It was unlikely she would still be there. Would she even remember me anyway? Come to think of it, we didn't even say goodbye when I left. That was rude of me, but I thought, if her mother was still there, I could perhaps ask about her. So I ran over to the house and rang the doorbell. Coming! Emko's mother appeared at the door. I debated whether I should explain everything to her, when she looked at me and said, Oh, Eschan, is that you? Wow, you've gotten so big. Come in, have a cup of tea or something. I went inside. What's all this about? Showing up here so suddenly? Oh no, I I'm here on work and was feeling a little nostalgic. I caught her up on recent events in my life and then cut straight to what I wanted to ask her. What's Emko doing these days? Silence filled the room for what felt like five minutes. Her mother just looked at the ground and made no attempt to speak. I wondered if perhaps I'd said something wrong, but then finally she spoke. You were still small, so you didn't know. Then you left for Tokyo, and we never got to tell you. I had no idea what she was saying, but then she told me everything. What follows is Emko's mother's story. I've corrected her dialect to standard Japanese, and her story was a little longer than this, but I've cut out the unnecessary parts. 
The story also touched on some human rights issues, so I left those parts out. This happened when Emco was still only one year old. At the time, this area hadn't yet been opened up. It was just a small village in the mountains. What people now would call an assimilation district, I think. In any case, it was a small hamlet of formerly discriminated people. You've heard at least a little about that, haven't you? So, a government official came and informed us that they would be opening the area up, and the villagers got into a big fight with him. Looking at it from our point of view, we wanted to live out the rest of our lives here quietly and peacefully. The fact that they wanted to build such a large residential development area was unthinkable. So, all of the men in the village got together to discuss what to do. In this area, there's a legend called Kotori Kozo. If you sacrifice a young girl under the age of two to him, it said he will destroy your enemies. No sacrifice had taken place in over 20 years, but the village chief said, We'll make a sacrifice to Kotori Kozo. All the men agreed. Yes! It's the only way! Emko was the only girl under two, and so the target fell right on her head. Of course, both myself and her father opposed it, but in the end there was nothing we could do, and the chief took a crying Emko from us to be sacrificed to Kotori Kozo. There's a mountain over there called Mount G, right? At the top of that mountain there's a shrine. I think you've been there before. That shrine is dedicated to Kotori Kozo. That's where the village chief took her, ripped crying from our arms. But after all that, the plans were drawn up and they opened the space up anyway. Of course, the hamlet was also destroyed in the process. From the people that used to live here, some remained, some were moved to other parts of the prefecture, and we were all split up. And Kotori Kozo proved to be nothing but a legend. You and your family moved here just after the town opened, didn't you? At this point, I started to panic. No way, I mean, when I was a kid I used to play with Emko, right? I came here to play all the time, and you were here when I did. My voice raised as I frantically questioned her. Then she started speaking again. Yes, that's right. You often played with Emko. I often saw you playing by yourself out in the streets. And you often came in here alone, going up to Emko's room to play. I can't see Emko, you know. But then her father said, Ah, uh, S-chan can see Emko, and she's at an age where all she wants to do is play. Just let them play for a little while longer. Then at some point we stopped seeing you playing alone. I later heard that every year the first grade goes up Mount G for a school trip. You went too, didn't you? I'm just guessing. But I think that when you went to visit the shrine on Mount G, Emko was finally able to go to heaven. I always planned to tell you once you got bigger, but then you suddenly moved to Tokyo. Both myself and my husband were worried, but I'm glad I finally got to talk to you today. Emko's grave isn't too far from here. If you have time, I think she would be very happy if you went to visit it. I was in tears. It never once crossed my mind that all that time I had been playing with a ghost. No. More than that, I even firmly believed that there was no such thing as ghosts. 
I mean, I'm a science major. Science is everything to me. But I couldn't stop the tears from falling down my face and could do nothing but nod as Emko's mother told me her story. I went to visit Emko's grave and then I returned to Tokyo. Just recently, I feel like I've finally sorted everything out in my head, so I thought I'd post a thread about it. I still don't know if the infamous Kotori Bako and Kotori Kozo have anything in common, nor do I know if Emko's mother's story was even really true. But in my mind, Emko really existed. I still remember the warmth of her hand as we walked up the mountain together that day. She really was my first love. So I think we're just going to end the video here. Iceman X, signing off.